and we're up and running. G'day Brad, g'day Jono, it's for you guys that we're doing this today. <laughs> so here we are, a little, I'll just come and say, give them, give them a wave, guys. That's really cool. Yeah. What is it? The bag. Yeah. Somehow in there it is, it's recording. So you'll be a little bit put off while we do this, just for fun. <laughs> obviously I'll just upload it to YouTube and the guys can get the lesson straight from there from what we're doing today. So if you get your notebooks out, we're going to do a bit of stuff on... Um, on ecosystems, we're going to do a little bit of stuff on chemicals, and I'll just get the PowerPoint up and running. And then a little later in the lesson, we're going to head out and take those holders off the spears. I know that we've got bull rings here yet, but I'll, I'll check with Mr. Mitchell, see what he's, what he's got. A little bit of a funny story for you with regards to that. I've, I've done it a number of times over the years, and I had Neary High ring up oh, it's two years, three years ago. It must have been three years now. They rang up and said, oh, we need someone to come and put the rings in our, our steers. So I went over there after school caught up with them and uh, sorted out both their animals, they had a couple of, couple of steers. So that was all fine and then they found out there was some regulations that they had to follow where they have to get a vet in to do it these days, so yeah, I don't know that we have to play the same game where we have to follow the same set of instructions, but um, that's, that's a little game that they have to do these days. A little bit of overkill, it'd be like saying getting a vet in to mules your sheep didn't do that. So I'll just take you back to last lesson. And you can see there we were looking at the difference between native and farmed ecosystems. What was the main difference that we have between these? So if we're, we're looking at the farming ecosystem, quite often we talk about a black box model where we have inputs going into our system and then coming out of it, we have outputs. And there's obviously processes that happen here. How well that's taping, but anyway, there we go. So black box model inputs, processes, and then outputs. So, what other than inputs and outputs do we have in a farming ecosystem? What other? What are, what, what's another difference between a, a farming oh, I... ecosystem and a native sort of one? Oh, yep. is it that? Well, we put in seed, if we're, we're looking at that, and we're taking out seed. We're putting in a few other things as well, but the reality is we put in one seed and we're taking out a whole pile of seeds for that one seed we've put in. But, yeah, what are some other differences? Would one be that all the producers that consume seed because it's a native, in the native? Yeah, we should expect to find native... Uh, all of those producers, consumers, decomposers, yep, absolutely. Whereas here in our farmed ecosystem, what's the difference there? That we've, we've introduced them, that's right. All right, any other differences? Okay, so in the farming ecosystem, we need to bring in extra things like fertiliser, good. How come? Why does the farming ecosystem get out of balance? I don't know, but then it gets like weed problems. All right, so there's potential weed problems there. So why, like, would it get out of balance because... Is it because, like, you're trying to... You're trying to plant something, but then, like, the natives, it kind of comes in and tries to plant it, like, 
nature's trying to do its own thing yeah. alongside of you. So why is it that nature comes in and has some success alongside of our farm? Is it because it's dismantled and it's just practical? So what is it that makes it work well? Why do weeds grow so well, Morgan? Any ideas? Why do why do weeds do such a good job? So we we're bringing things in, and that can help the weeds. That's true. But what if we didn't put anything there? Would the weeds be there? Why? The weeds are natural. But what is it about the weeds? The well, the, all right. So we've got native, natural type weeds. What is it about them? Good. So the climate is well suited and also the the soil. All right. So when we say rainfall, we're also picking up with climate there. All right. So we're talking about temperature, rain, but the soil has to be right as well. And that's well suited to certain sorts of weed species. They grow beautifully. And then somewhere in there, we're bringing in our wheat variety or you know, farmed monoculture type crop that we want to grow and that does, you know, fairly well. We're trying to choose them from regions that have grown those sorts of plants and, and try and adapt and evolve plants that do well. But in amongst that we have weeds or plants that have been there in the first place that actually are well suited to that. They just don't give us any product. And so somewhere in there we've got to balance that. And sometimes, you know, people get a bit hung up and say, we need to control all the weeds and have absolutely nothing there. But if the weeds aren't impacting all that much on our crop, we need to balance that out as well. Like, is it economically viable to control those weeds 100% dead? Sometimes, somewhere in there, there's a tolerance. Uh, it's actually very impractical to be able to kill everything 100% dead. So, we're talking about monocultures here. We're talking about variety here with the natives all right so everyone's pretty happy with that yeah all right uh what about if we bring in a new species to the ecosystem now i want you to copy this down basically as soon as we bring a new species in our ecosystem becomes out of balance So that's the first thing, the ecosystem gets out of balance. If we have uh, natural predators and they're removed, then that's going to mean that something that those predators were actually eating will end up flourishing. Right. What could be an example of that? Someone different? Sorry? All right, so if we've got foxes as a predator, what do foxes eat? Rabbit, rabbit. Rabbits and? Lamb. Hey? Lamb. They love lambs. Anything else? Birds. Yeah, they would eat birds. So we remove foxes out of our ecosystem, and all of a sudden we have lots more rabbits. Lot, hopefully lots more lambs. We like that. All right. Birds, well, it's going to depend on the bird as to whether it's a helpful one or not. Um, vineyards around here might not be all that happy about having certain birds around the place, but essentially, um, yeah, there's that, that effect, that knock-on effect. So let's think about the rabbits for a minute because that's the obvious rabbit-fox type thing. We end up with lots of rabbits. What's the knock-on effect of that? So the rabbits will eat our, our crops, they'll eat our pastures, and so we have less yield from our, from our wheat crops. Um, we obviously end up with, uh, from our pastures, if we have reduced pasture, what does that mean? What's the knock-on effect of that for our farm? Okay, so our livestock haven't got as much feed to eat. So having foxes around is good. Do you like that statement? Yeah. Foxes are good? 
All right, so. I feel we more like the moment, right? So you've got that two young Gamma Rays just killing the Rays in the field. So why do people go out shooting foxes then? Just not making sure the Rays are also back in the Rays, which is another thing that can play with it. Okay, so people will bait foxes, they'll shoot foxes, they'll try and reduce the numbers a little bit. We've identified the fact that some foxes are helpful for reducing rabbit populations, but the foxes aren't helpful because they affect our lamb populations. What are we ultimately trying to control here? We're trying to ultimately control rabbits, aren't we? We're trying to get better numbers of lambs. How can we control our rabbits other than with foxes? We could bait the rabbits. Diseases like Myxomatosis and Khaleesi virus, good. What else can we do to rabbits? Trap them. Trap them. Are you allowed to trap? It's illegal now, isn't it? So once upon a time, when I was your age, we were we were allowed to go out with rabbit traps and bam, snap. What about cage traps? Cage traps. That probably would be alright. But people don't tend to do that. Why? No, it's not because they're really agile. Oh, checking them every day, I mean, it's probably no different to if you had a rabbit trap. Hey? Can you mark up the Oh, no, I don't think so. I mean, you could set up a trap that, that would be right. I don't think you'd be worried about that. If we could trap foxes, that wouldn't be a bad thing either. If it attracted a fox to the rabbit trap where the rabbit is, you know, well, the, say, the, say the fox then kills the rabbit, that's probably not a problem. Oh, so you're saying that if we have rabbits that are getting caught and foxes come along and they sort of look over the fence and go, oh, actually, there's a tasty lamb over there, I'll go into that. No, they'll be full. Cool. Yeah, they'll be They might come back after. They might keep looking. Yeah, okay. Because they can see those Well, so far, all we've really identified here is two, two real ways of getting our rabbits dead. One is by shooting them. Well, three. One's by shooting them. One's by allowing Foxy Loxy to do his thing. And the other is by trapping them. Yeah, why, why wouldn't, oh, and diseases, good, but why would we not want to trap? What could be the problems there? Because it's a trap for the farm and the farm. All right. How many traps do you think you'd need on a farm? You'd need a lot, and it could be expensive, and it could be fairly time-consuming to check on the rabbit traps. Would that be fair to say? take space as well. Alright, so now we're probably getting a bit deeper into what we're on about here. So what do you think other than those techniques the farmers do to kill rabbits? Blowing them up. Find the rabbit warrant, put in a stick of jelly and it works. Other than other than a stick of jelly, what else do people do? You can use ferrets, but that's not a wide practice. Why not? Yeah, I don't reckon they'd be too hard to train. You do you have to teach them to go down holes and clean? If you think about it, outside of rabbit hunting season, yeah, it comes back to timing. It's a bit like the traps, you know, it's, it's not very time effective. Stick of jelly, bam, that's easy, isn't it? So other than that, there's one more technique, and I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but deep ripping the burrows. All right, so basically you disturb the burrows, you dig it up, and uh, the soil so that, that works. So, all right, we've got our, we're getting our rabbit population down by using a few different farming techniques. That's obviously helpful. What does that mean for foxes? They've got less food. They've got less food, and so they start to look for lambs. They've got to find other sources. So it's an interesting one. Really, if we're going to be controlling foxes, it'd be smart to also be thinking about our rabbits and vice versa. You with me there?
All right, we're going to control our rabbits. We need to also be thinking about our foxes. We need to be thinking a little bit broader than just the one immediate pest. So for the absence of a natural predator, the species can thrive and that can cause lots of problems. Now, we've got a few examples here of, of things that have, thri have thrived over the years. One is prickly pear. Have you heard of that before? Do you know what it is? Watch the documentary. Watch the documentary. All right. And they're in season now, so you can make something interesting out of them. That's right. So you know, there's a plant that got away. They brought in the, in the uh, it was a wasp, wasn't it? it? Laid a larva, and that ended up being able to control them. Okay. Salvation Jane, similar sort of story. A plant that got out of control, and so we needed to come up with a, a predator or a technique for controlling that. Bridal veil creeper. What happened with that? Once the bridal veil creeper was gone, then the bug population dropped. That makes sense. All right. Um, just an interesting... Well, we've got a few different things we've had a look at now as far as modifying an you know, ecosystem goes. But the key to it is that if you haven't got something that can control your prickly pear or your foxes or rabbits, you know, they can explode, population explosion, and suddenly you've got a really big problem on your hands. Now, I've just got to switch this little baby on. Now, if we remove a species from the ecosystem, and yeah, I do want you to get this down, suddenly we've moved the food source. We've removed the food source, then whatever's been eating that food source has to find something different. And just as you guys identified just before, you remove the rabbits, and you've got the same number of foxes they're going to be eating you know, birds, lambs, or whatever they can get their hands on. In our example here, we've got a rabbit population um, and looking at eagles. What are the eagles going to do? They don't have their rabbit population there. They're going to be looking at maybe native animals. <coughs> Just look at the third point that we've got here, and that is what problems might flow from removing scrub. Should put a comma in there, scrub. It's a kind of wheat crop. I want you to think about that for a minute. And then once we've once we've had a look at that, um, we get hypothesize, and then we'll stop, we'll go out, we'll get the cattle in.
this product clearing already was cleared. And what did you what do you remember from all right, so we've got potential issues with erosion if we remove scrub. What other potential issues do we have? The rise of the water table. Rise of the water table. Is there anything else that you can think of other than the rise of the water table and erosion? Okay, so suddenly also we've taken away habitats. And I am going to write up on the board around here that'll do that. I can lose it. Okay, so we are identifying things that happen if we remove scrub. First thing we said was, um, what was the first thing we said? Yeah, erosion. Second was water table. Third, habitat. Anything else? I think they're good, good uh, examples. What's the impact of? Erosion, that's a pretty obvious one, isn't it? We're, we're losing soil, all right? If we clear our scrub, does that mean that all the soil erodes straight away? No. It leaves it more vulnerable, so how's someone gonna manage that? What's that? Well, if you do that, how are you gonna grow your wheat crop? We wanna grow a wheat crop, we just don't want to stuff up our environment. All right, so we could actually set up some shelter belts. Yeah, it'll provide a windbreak. So, you, so we've got a, a paddock there. If you've got really sandy soil, which is going to blow really easily, it's not actually the world's silliest thing to think about putting some shelter belts in and then cropping in, in amongst that. But you lose a little bit of farming land. There's some costs involved in that. Hidden in there when we're talking about changing habitats, there might be things that live in those shelter belts that could impact on your wheat crop alongside. Something to think about. Yeah. Correct. Correct. As soon as you put a shelter belt in there, immediately outside of where you're trying to grow your wheat crop, you have less water there because they tend to jump out and so you have less yield. Also, Not a problem. It does take time. Probably as soon as you can get some, some ground cover there though, it should be all right. Now, people aren't growing large numbers of shelter belts around here. They're obviously farming in different ways. Has anyone got any awareness about that? James, would you be able to give us a little bit of insight into how our farming land is not eroding so much these days? What are farmers doing slightly differently? Right. Alright, let's, let's pick on this no-till farming system. So using no-till farming system, what's happening? Yeah, producing more Alright, so we're digging the soil up less. We're leaving more... We're able to have more structure in the soil because what are we leaving more of in our paddocks? More stubble, more crop residue. We're using implements that we can actually go through and leave a fair bit of stubble material. Right, a fair bit of crop residue. The beauty of that is that that then provides its own little ecosystem, its own little shelter, so that you're not able to have as much wind erosion or water erosion. The water seems to settle in and go in well through having better structured soils. Is that sort of making sense? So by changing our farming techniques, and really we're only talking in the last 15 to 20 years, 
that people are really moving into Motil in a big way, there's capacity there for us to actually do fairly well from an erosion perspective. So I'm going to put a little bit of a tick against that one. I think that probably we're heading in the right direction with things with that. The water table's an interesting one, though. Water tables vary depending on where you are. All right? They do vary in depth, and there's a lot of farmers that will test the depth of their water table and monitor that on a regular basis. If the water table's low, do we have an issue? What's the issue there? It's probably unlikely that the plants will get into the water table in a lot of cases, just purely because of the depth of the thing. All right. If you think about at home, if you've got some windmills, how, or you know a bore, how far do you have to send that down before you get into the water table to start drawing water out? It's usually a fairly long way. Often, often. <laughs> but what we're talking about here is the salty areas on the farm. Have you got any? All right. Where do where do you think you're going to find salty areas on farms? It's going to be where the water tables basically come fairly close to the surface. Yeah, no, it's a little bit different because what we're talking about here is dry land farming and removing plants so that we can grow a wheat crop and people don't generally water a wheat crop generally. All right? um, it's, you, there's probably a couple of funny little examples that you might discover if you, you're heading to the southeast, but I think you just need to pigeonhole them. But essentially, yeah, you, you'll find that uh, people don't water their wheat crops. That's what we do for clean table salt. So what we're talking about here is if the water table rises and we've got the risk of salt, you know, we've got a bit of an issue on our hands, so how are we going to deal with that? Well, really, we've got to try and pump some of that water out. All right, how do we pump that water out? By using trees. All right. So... What people tend to do in those low-lying areas where we have, um, you know, salt issues, they'll often fence those areas off, plant deep root of perennials in those areas, and then they'll monitor the rest of the farm and make sure that the water table is not too high to cause issues. So that's something worth being aware of if we if we remove scrub. The habitat's an interesting one, obviously, as well. So as soon as you remove habitats, what are you doing for your local environment and, and native species? That needs thought. And the government sort of looks at that as well, because farmers farmers tend to think about it from a oh here's a paddock that I'd like to clear and make a make a bit of money from. But there's also regulations and legislation out there that says no, you can't just go and wholesale clear land in this day and age. Um, there's there's a couple of good case studies from down the southeast, and I might dig one of them up for you at some stage, just where there's. There's a, a couple of big farmers that have gone out and cleared land against government regulations and got in a lot of hot water as a result of it. So, yeah, it's an interesting one. All right, I want to stop there and we will go out and play with steers. Okay. See you, boys, wherever you are over there. <laughs>